the Informed Use of Multilingualism in PKP Software webinar. Um, my name is Emma Uhl. I am a publication support specialist for the Public Knowledge Project, and I'm presenting this today in partnership with um, Jessica Clark from EDD, who is one of our partner, partner organizations, and together we form Coalition Publica. So without delay, we're gonna start introducing some of the preamble for the uh, webinar, and then we can get right into the content. So first up, just a reminder, we are going to be recording the session and we will make the recording available to you later um, through email and likely through our YouTube channel as well. So as you know, we are being recorded right now. So thank you very much for your cooperation. Um, I'm just going to run through the outline of what we're going to be talking today um, about today. So we're gonna start with a brief introduction to our three organizations, which is Public Knowledge Project, EDG and Coalition Publica. They're going to be talking about what we're calling informed uses of multilingualism um, and providing some examples of how multilingual journals tend to look in OJS, um, as well as the sort of specific and granular details about configuring languages and the various options available to you within OJS and the other PKP software as well. Um, and my colleague will be talking to you about some best practices or rather recommended practices for managing multilingual metadata. And finally, we'll have a conclusion and then time for some questions and answers after the webinar. So first of all, you may be wondering who sort of the intended audience of this webinar is. Um, this webinar starts very broadly and then becomes more specific over time. And the idea here is that we're considering a range of perspectives from someone who is maybe just considering at this point adopting PKP software for multilingual publication um, to existing users who want to better understand the specific settings within the software, and maybe even non-users who just want to understand how multiple languages work um, with indexing services and publication in sort of a, a greater way. And so we really encourage you to come back to this webinar, um, the recording and the slides that we share it later at any time, because we're sure that some of the information may be uh, a little difficult to digest when there's just so much of it in this webinar. And additionally, a non-insignificant portion of the webinar is based on a relatively recently created piece of documentation called the Using PKP Software in Multiple Languages documentation. There's a link on the slide and we'll link it again later, but um, you can also refer to this guide at any time for a significant portion of the information that's included in this webinar. I'm gonna introduce some key terms to you that are going to come up later in this presentation. Um, the first being metadata. So metadata is information about information. And in this case, it will be information about a publication. So this includes things like titles, subtitles, abstracts, keywords, author lists, all of these things count as metadata. So metadata is particularly important to libraries and indexing or discovering services like Google Scholar, PubMed, the Directory of Open Access Journals, et cetera. Another term that comes up, well, more an acronym that comes up a lot is UI, which stands for user interface. So this is the part of the software that um, users can interact with in, a, in, in order to accomplish uh, the tasks that they want to accomplish within the software. So uh, your UI is comprised of things like menus, drop downs, um, text fields, dashboards, that type of thing. And lastly is the term locale versus language. So they're used interchangeably throughout this webinar. There is a technical difference, but it does not matter to most users, but just to be clear, a locale is a computing term that refers to the entire package of files and the parameters configurations that allow a software to know that it's meant to operate in another language and then to pick the languages, uh, the files of that language. So we're going to introduce our organizations to you now. So I will start. Um, this webinar is specifically about the software that we've developed here at Public Knowledge Project. So you probably know at least a little bit about us, but just to get out of the way, um, we are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to developing open source software, conducting research and furthering open access to scholarly research. So we were founded in 1998 by John Walensky at the University of British Columbia here in Canada, which means that it's our 21st birthday this year. Um, so we're the developer of open journal systems, OJS, open monograph press, OMP, and open preprint systems. And if you have been around for a long time, you may also know about open conference systems. And I'm going to pass it along to Jessica to introduce uh, Edu D and Coalition Publica to you. Thanks, Thanks Emma. Um, 
So uh, Eridi is uh, a Canadian uh, inter-university consortium that's based at the University of Montreal, but that is supported by a number of other universities in Quebec and Canada. And our mission is to support open digital publishing and research in the humanities and social sciences. We provide a range of services in digital research, publishing, and dissemination. Um, the probably most notable one is the erudi.org platform, which is the leading dissemination platform for Canadian social sciences and humanities research. Uh, we host over 300 journals on the platform and um, the collection of research uh, is consulted by many millions of people worldwide, uh, including uh, the users of over uh, 1,100 uh, documentary institutions like libraries worldwide. Uh, we were also founded in 1998, and um, it is also our 25th birthday this year. In terms of uh, who we are as Coalition Publica, um, Coalition Publica is uh, a partnership uh, between our two organizations, between NDD and the Pub Public Knowledge Project. And um, we put this uh, partnership in place a number of years ago with the specific goal of advancing research dissemination and digital scholarly publishing in Canada, in particular as it relates to helping um, our Canadian social sciences and humanities journal community transition to open access. And um, because we're working with two groups um, based in uh, two different parts of our country with uh, two different kind of language communities. We have our own approach to bilingualism. Um, the main thing is that uh, from the beginning of our par partnership, we focused on fostering mutual respect, um, which uh, helps us to collaborate productively uh, between our two teams. And we have specific guidelines for having bilingual meetings uh, which again start with that um, principle of mutual respect and uh, everyone is welcome to speak in French or English as they preferred. Uh, we encourage everyone to speak slowly and clearly in whatever language that they uh, prefer and then uh, ask, um, we encourage people to ask for clarification if they have not understood something. Um, we also uh, make formal, uh, formal documents like the agendas for committee, committee meetings um, available ahead of time in both languages, but for informal communications, um, such as emails between our colleagues, um, we encourage people to use uh, automated translation tools such as DeepL or Google Translate. So back to you, Emma. Thank you so much, Jessica. So a quick disclaimer, now that you've heard a bit of the context um, of how we operate, um, recommended practices around multilingualism and scholarly publishing are really part of an ongoing conversation. So because of this shared bilingual French English context and our Canadian context, we think that probably some of the things that we talk about here might not be the perfect fit for your journal or your language community or your specific needs. Um, so you may better understand what we talk about today as sort of um, a potential starting place for your regional language community to start building up your own recommendations that um, suit a specific language. And in a similar vein, uh, this webinar is going to refer a lot to OJS specifically, but the majority of this information, especially around settings and the general principle of how the software works, applies to OMP and OPS as well. It's just we have a much larger pool of OJS examples to pull from. So without further ado, we're going to be talking about uh, what we've decided to call informed uses of multilingualism. So in this section, we're going to give you some details about different models for multilingualism that you could use in your published environment, um, as well as some necessary considerations that you'll need to make when you're planning how to use multiple languages with PKP software. So knowing in advance which areas of your journal or publication are intended to be multilingual are going to be what allows you to write clear guidelines for your authors and editors so that they can enter multilingual metadata or make multilingual submissions. And this will also help with uh, preparing translations for your basic uh, journal or publishing information such as submission guidelines, descriptions of the journals or monographs, um, 
privacy policies, these types of things. Um, so there are several options for setting up multilingualism in PKP software. Um, the first approach that I wanna talk about today is um, publishing articles in multiple languages without providing translations. This would mean, for example, accepting submissions in English and Spanish, but expecting that readers will either be fluent in both languages or willing to use translation tools or otherwise just understand that some articles might not be in a language that they understand. Um, another approach is to publish articles and include translations with these translated versions of the article, either included as an additional galley or as a separate article altogether. An approach that sort of combines a bit of both of the previous two approaches is one where only article metadata is translated with the article text, the main body text left in the original language. So this can be useful for readers to understand if an article is related to their um, research, especially for areas with little research or if they happen to have a native language where uh, research in that field is still kind of nascent. Um, but the sort of issue with this approach is that some indexing services really are, they don't get along well with this type of um, metadata only publication. So, and this can also be frustrating for readers if it's not very clear to them that just because the metadata is in their language or in a language that they understand, the article text may not be available in that same language. And last but not least, you can always go the route of just making your site's user interface available in multiple languages, even if you don't have the capacity, the resources and the time to manage multilingual submissions. So this can be seen as a nice gesture for countries or other cultural contexts where multiple languages are used just to sort of, I guess, acknowledge this uh, cultural aspect. So once you sort of establish the approach you'd like to take with consideration to the time, labor and resource availability that you have, the next step is to check the completeness of the software translation. So all of the software that the Public Knowledge Project provides is kindly translated on volunteer time and effort. And since it's a very large task to translate an entire suite of software, especially on volunteer time, a lot of our translations are only partially completed. So our software translation platform where the actual translation work is done for text in the software is Weblate. And when you access Weblate, you'll be able to see a list of languages as well as a rough percentage of the translation completion. And uh, please note that this includes all three softwares and several plugins. So just because a translation is not currently at 100% doesn't mean it won't be usable for you. Um, when you click the language, you're going to be shown a variety of components, which basically refers to the different pieces that make up PKP software. So there are three components that are sort of of note when you're looking at Weblate. There are the individual software components that are each labeled with the name of each software. So that's OJS or POPS. And uh, these contain texts that are relevant to that specific software. Sort of conversely, we have the shared infrastructure component, which is um, the PKP web application library. So this contains files that are used by all three softwares. So for example, OJS, OMP, and OPS all have a submission system. So rather than create a uh, new text or uh, repeat text, uh, we can just translate it in this shared infrastructure file and it will be applied to all of the software. And last but not least, we also have um, the plugin specific components which are labeled with the plugin name and this contains the plugins that the text for the plugins that are shipped with our software by default. So just as an example of how you can check the completeness of a translation and also how the percentage is can be sometimes a little deceiving. We had a client with the, our hosting services that graciously dedicated a significant amount of time to developing a traditional Chinese translation of the reader facing user interface of OJS. So not necessarily the dashboard or editor functions, but simply so that readers could have a seamless experience in traditional Chinese. So despite the low percentage of the completion for the PKP web application library component, that's really actually all that's needed to display the UI interface fully translated for readers. Um, so yeah, it still it excludes things like the submission wizard, but it's quite an achievement uh, and it takes a lot of time even just to get to this point. So I really encourage anybody with concerns or doubts about the usability of a translation to not rely solely on these numbers of the percentage translated and to take a look at the individual files available for translation and, and check that the 
the text that has been translated is relevant and important to you. And I'd also like to introduce to you uh, this default translation plugin. So this is a plugin that is included with our software at installation. It's one of the default uh, provided plugins. So it can be installed from the plugin gallery and enabled at any time by anybody, any role that has the permissions to install and enable plugins. So when a translation is missing in OGS, the untranslated text usually displays as a string ID, which is this um, sort of like two hashtags and then some keywords, some ID names separated by periods. Um, these string IDs are useful when you're testing translations because you can just search the ID, or at least the piece without the hashtags within the translation platform to find the string and then translate it if you need it. But if you're at the stage where you've already deployed the site and you have readers and editors working on it, it's not very useful. It's not always clear uh, what the ID is actually referring to and what the purpose of the field or the text is. Um, so by enabling this default translation plugin, the untranslated, so the original sort of source English text will be shown instead of this ID, which means that people can at least uh, translate it or perhaps understand it if they have some knowledge of English. So I'm going to take us through some brief examples of ways that journals are actually using multilingualism and how that actually looks in OJS specifically. So the first one we're going to look at is a trilingual journal. So this is um, Encounters, it's a trilingual journal that aims to generate a vigorous scholarly dialogue among educational researchers from Canada, Spain, and Latin America in the theories and histories of education. So knowing that this is sort of their mission, um, we can see that all three languages are represented in this screenshot from the table of contents. So I was using the English interface to access the website. So as you can see, the PDF tags, the ones that are in English are not marked in a language. If I were to switch to um, the French interface, it would change. So the PDFs in French would be the ones that didn't have the, the language in brackets after. But this is a great example of a journal that intentionally uses multilingualism to foster academic discussion between a variety of regions and also encourages readers to explore research that may not be written in their native language. Another example that I want to show you is East West, the Journal of Ukrainian Studies. So this journal accepts submissions only in English, but it does provide translations of select articles in Ukrainian as a galley alongside the original article. So if you take a look under the um, cover image with me, you'll see there's a PDF without a language label. So that is the original English language PDF and beneath it, a PDF labeled with uh, the Ukrainian language and that is the provided translation. So, this model does not work particularly well if you're a journal that is very concerned about having multilingual metadata or having the translated versions of these articles indexed by discovery services, but it really works well for the intent and scale of this particular translation project. So this description on the side here basically explains that uh, this journal is part taking part in an interuniversitary uh, academic cooperative initiative that allows graduate students the opportunity to translate some academic work as part of their capstone projects. So to me, it seems that these translations are maybe more about the process of getting students actively involved in academic translation. So perfect indexing and the metadata strategy for these translations are less important. But this is a great example of sort of a flexible, low maintenance use of multilingualism in OJS. So, Another example I want to show you is the RPG Gakukinkyu, the Japanese Journal of Analog Role-Playing Game Studies. So this is just an example of, uh, I'll go back and forth between the two screens shortly, but um, the user interface in a non-Latin language and a demonstration of multiple galleys in varying formats and languages with fully translated metadata. So once again, if we take a look under the image, uh, the cover image, you'll see that there's HTML and PDF without a language label. Those are the ones provided in English. And then in brackets on the side are the HTML and PDF in Japanese. So if I switch to the next screen, you'll see that those labels are now inverted because uh, the English is labeled and you'll see that the metadata is completely translated, including even the um, author's name has now been rendered in the target language. Uh, another example I want to show you today is the Canadian Medical Education Journal. So this is an example of the translated metadata only approach. So metadata is always available on this journal in both French and English, even though articles are monolingual. There's typically not translations uh, or 
alternate language versions of the article. Um, but as you can see, uh, the metadata is available in French. And last but not least, I want to show you the Journal of Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Studies. So this is just an example of a right to left oriented language in OJS. If you're familiar with the OJS um, look, if you will, the way it typically looks, you'll know that the sidebar is usually on the other side. The um, right to left orientation even affects um, the, the layout of the site. So it just may be something that you had never seen before. So next I'm going to show you how to enable and configure the languages in OJS. So after you've assessed your language needs and your approach and maybe consulted some examples of journals that are doing the type of publishing that you wish to be doing, um, and then you check that there is a proper translation available, the next thing you're gonna want to do is install the locale. So once again, a locale is just sort of a computing term for language, it's the package of configurations and files that define a language in the software. So we're using them interchangeably but um, only your site administrator can install locale. So you might need to contact either your designated site administrator or your hosting service in order to accomplish this task. Once the locale is installed, you can enable it for any journal hosted on the site. If it happens to be a multi press or a multi journal site um, under website settings, setup languages, you'll be given a list with all the installed locales and a variety of options that can be selected for each. So as you can see in this table, there's um, primary locale, UI, forms, and submissions. So I'm gonna explain each one of these options to you and sort of the finer details so you can ensure that you fully understand what each one is actually allowing you to do in the software. So first up um, is maybe the most important one, uh, is primary locale. So you will be able to designate one and exactly one language as your primary locale. This is essentially your default language. It's gonna be the one that your users will first see when they access your site. So one thing about the primary locale is that we really strongly recommend that you be very careful about your primary locale selection. And that once you have decided on a primary locale, that you refrain from changing it once the journal has been properly set up and launched. Um, if you change your primary locale later on, this can very severely impact your journal as uh, the data for your journal information, and this includes stuff like user registrations, are initially going to be only required in your primary locale. So this means if you switch primary locales, you may have some places where that data was not filled out, which can lead to some gaps and missing pieces in your data journal, uh, in your journal data. So please choose your primary locale carefully and stick with it. The next option, that you can enable is the UI or the user interface. So you can enable this option for as many languages as you'd like. Um, when this is checked off, the front and back end interfaces, so both the view that your people will see when they access your site for the first time, and as well as when they log in and they go to make submissions in the link, um, will be available in the language. And users are also going to be given the option to change languages that will. So by default, the one way you can change languages is by logging in and then accessing the sort of profile icon in the upper right, and then you'll have a drop down where you can select them. But um, in addition to that language toggle, we have uh, many journals who enable the language toggle block. So this is in, again, in the plugin gallery under the, the block plugin section, um, you can enable it at any time and then arrange it to your liking in the sidebar section of your journal's website up here in settings. And this will create a permanent menu with the language options on every page of your journal, every outward facing page. So your users can easily um, toggle between languages basically at will. So next is the forms option, which again, you can enable this for as many languages as you'd like. So when this is enabled any fillable forms in the system, with the very notable exception of submission metadata will be available in that language. So this is used for content such as your journal descriptions, your author, author submission checklists, your guidelines, uh, copyright notices, privacy policies, et cetera. So here I'm gonna show you what that looks like in practice. Um, so the language that you have selected as your OJS interface is the one that's gonna be shown as by default. So in this case, English. Um, but you can show any additional languages that have had the forms checkbox ticks off from the menu at the top, which is highlighted in a red box over there. So once you click on one of these given languages, it will display the same field alongside your interface language. So in this case, we have English on the left, um, my interface language, and then French on the right, which is the one that I selected. So you can easily translate in sort of this parallel window 
um, view the, the information that is relevant for your journal. When you enable forms, you will also see these globe icons next to pretty much any fillable field in OJS. Um, and these are used to indicate the number of languages that the form has been filled out in. So for example, if you have three languages enabled, English, Arabic, French, um, and you have a green icon, that means that the information has been filled out for all three. And red will indicate that one or more are missing. So you can see in the screenshot that um, my journal title has been translated in all three available languages, but I am a language short for the abbreviation. And below that, the gray icon just means that you have not filled out this information in any language. Um, yeah, so you can click on the globe at any time to see the number of languages. And this can just be useful for determining sort of at a glance uh, what information might be missing from your various languages as you're working through OJS. So forms and UI work together to sort of create a completely translated website. Um, so I'm gonna show you kind of how this looks like in practice. Um, as you can see, any default system text is, which is highlighted in the screenshot in red, these are all enabled and the translations are enabled by selecting the UI option for the selected language. So in this case, by enabling the French UI option, I'm able to have everything highlighted here in red available in French. And this sort of pairs with the um, forms option. So translations of all manually entered text, including in this case, there's custom navigation items. Here they're highlighted in blue. This is what is uh, translated when you select the forms option and then fill in the information that you have prepared in the relevant language. So by having both UI and forms, I can put these two pieces together, both the red and the blue, and have a completely translated site. The so last, but certainly not least, perhaps even the most important for some people, um, is the submission option, which can be, again, enabled for as many languages as you'd like. So this option is what allows authors to specify the language of their article submission. And it also allows authors, editors, journal managers, et cetera, to enter metadata in the selected language for submissions. So metadata, when you're making a submission, is only going to be required in the language that is set as the submission language. This is to say there's no way in OJS currently or any of the PKB software currently to require that authors include translated metadata or basically metadata in more than one language um, or articles at this stage. Additionally, you can always add optional metadata um, for any language that has submissions enabled later on. So the submission wizard will show authors metadata fields for every language with submissions enabled, regardless of what language they chose for their submission. And editors can, of course, add or edit multilingual metadata from the publication tab, the metadata tab, um, using the same sort of parallel text box system as the forms option. So this is what allows your editors to add translated metadata or galleys at a later stage in the workflow or to even um, publish an article, add new metadata, add new translations and republish the article. So next I'm going to pass this over to my lovely colleague, Jessica, to talk to you more about managing multilingual metadata. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I am just going to uh, go back to our little intro about our um, different organizations and you remind you of the context that we're working in. Um, we uh, operate in Canada where um, French, uh, French and English are official languages. Um, and this is the context that I'm gonna be speaking from. Um, I'm gonna talk about English and French metadata and OJS a lot, um, but you can still take away some principles for your context and the PKP software that you use. Um, one of uh, the main things that we do with um, Coalition Publica is uh, our technology transfers metadata and PDF galleys from OJS to the RD platform. Um, so that means that metadata quality is really important. Um, in fact, so important that we developed our own guide to um, assist our journal editors and um, their hosting institutions with providing me uh, quality metadata um, in OJS. And I'm just popping links to those guides in English and French into the chat 
so that you can refer to them later if you would like. Um, the metadata recommendations that you'll see in that guide, um, uh, again, are re most relevant to our context. And um, we are definitely um, prioritizing uh, indexing and managing uh, persistent identifiers like DOIs or digital object identifiers in a coherent way. And we're doing this in a context where bilingual metadata is really common. So all of that taken together, um, what follows are the big things that we have learned uh, about managing multilingual data in uh, multilingual metadata in OJS. Um, but again, uh, going back to a few basics, what is metadata and why is it important? Here's the uh, definition that uh, Emma shared at the outset of the webinar. Um, uh, metadata is information about information. Um, in this case, uh, as we talk about OJS, information about journal articles. And uh, this information is very important to uh, libraries and indexing and discovery services online, such as Google Scholar and the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, you might hear, if you haven't before, people talking about metadata flowing downstream. That means that the metadata that was created in uh, OJS for your journal does actually end up somewhere else where you have less control about it. Uh, of it. So you want to make sure that uh, when you create it in OJS, it's uh, as good as it can be. Um, metadata mainly helps people find and use the content in your journal. Um, and having really great metadata uh, improves discoverability and dissemination, i.e. you get more readers. And uh, perhaps indirectly also improves research impact because um, if people can't find an article, they can include it in their own research and build upon it and contribute, use it to continue to contribute to the scholarly record. Um, conversely, poor metadata um, flows downstream just as easily as good metadata, but it will reduce discoverability and will take a lot of time and effort to correct. Um, uh, first off, uh, when I want to talk about multilingual metadata in the coalition publica context, um, I, I need to acknowledge somewhat unfortunately that there are some things that OJS cannot do at the moment that you might expect it to be able to do. So as Emma mentioned, articles are tagged with their language at the moment of submission. Um, one big limitation is that right now there's currently no way to review or change a submission's main language um, in the back end. Um, and when I'm talking about the submission process, that could be the, uh, a submission by an author, by an editor, including via the quick submit plugin. So the language is indicated at that point, and then that is going to be the language that is registered for that submission. Um, in OJS. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, and then the second big limitation is that there's currently no way to display bilingual me metadata that's like, say, uh, an article in English that has an abstract in both English and French. There's no way to display those two ab uh, abstracts side by side for the reader. Um, so we do see a lot of journals misusing metadata fields to create this side-by-side -side display, and I'll show you some examples of this in a little bit. So our recommendations, uh, in particular for the settings, um, uh, the language settings for a journal, take these limitations into account. So let's talk about those settings now. Um, the journals that participate in Coalition Publica are required to enable the locale and check submissions for all languages in which they publish. So if a journal publishes articles in English, French, and Spanish, it needs to have the locales for English, French, and Sp Spanish installed and submissions checked for all three languages. Um, Enabling the UI is optional for our journals, though we do recommend this for journals that provide translated metadata, again, like an English article that has an abstract in English and French. Um, but we're not going to force anyone to enable a UI if they don't want to. Uh, we see that as a sort of marketing or community engagement decision that is best left to a journal's editorial team. 
but I'm going to share some thoughts about UI so that you might be able to decide or help uh, someone else decide whether they should en enable the, the UIs for multiple languages. Um, uh, I find that um, the, the way to decide whether or not to enable a user interface for a particular language, it does help to understand how multilingual metadata will display. Um, this might feel like a little bit of a discretion, uh, digression because it doesn't actually uh, affect how you would manage your multilingual data. It really is just something that affects the display of that metadata. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about English and French here just because it's easier to explain with um, examples with specific languages. Um, and um, to help you to understand the scenarios that I'm about to present, our main recommendation about multilingual metadata is that metadata in different languages should always be entered separately. OJS metadata fields are language specific when you've properly configured your language settings that Emma just um, reviewed. So the first scenario, uh, when bilingual metadata is present, so say an English and French abstract for an English article, and has been entered separately as we recommend, and the UI has been enabled for both English and French, here's what happens. Users viewing your website in English will see only the English metadata, and users viewing your website in French will see only the French metadata. Um, and I will uh, show you uh, an example on the next slide from um, a journal called uh, Loading. Um, this journal, as you can see, um, has published uh, an issue uh, that's entirely in French about video games in Quebec. And um, you see the titles uh, on uh, the table of contents with the PDF buttons, no language tag. And then here we changed the English interface and now the PDFs are um, uh, have a language tag. And um, the uh, actually, yes, play the video again. That would be great so that you can see how the, um, the titles of the articles were also translated. So there the titles are in French, uh, change to the English interface, and then the titles are in English, but the PDFs are tagged with the French label. Oh, uh, apologies, um, my notes just crashed. Uh, no worries. Um, should we take a pause and perhaps take some questions um, while Jessica troubleshoots? Uh, or I can pull them up again relatively quickly. I've got them here. Apologies. Okay, perfect. All right. So in the second scenario uh, in regards to UI, um, uh, this would be if you have unilingual metadata, i.e only English metadata for an article in English, but you have enabled the UI for both English and French. Um, users viewing your website um, in either language will see the English metadata. Basically, um, OJS will display the metadata that it has. So the um, example on the next slide is of the journal um, uh, Renaissance and Reformation. Uh, which publishes articles in both uh, English and French. They do not translate their metadata. So here we're looking at the English interface. We see uh, uh, article titles in English, as well as this one in French with the little language tag on its PDF button. We switch to the French interface. Um, we see again, those same articles, again, with the titles in the language of the article, but now the English articles have the language tag on their PDF button and the French article does not. And then in our last scenario, um, which is one that we do not generally recommend, but it is possible um, when uh, bilingual metadata is present and entered separately, 
but the UI for only one English, uh, uh, language, for example, English is enabled. Users viewing your website in English will see only the English metadata, because and this is the only way they can view it. And users will not be able to see the French metadata because the French UI has not been um, established. Um, uh, one thing that I um, sometimes see, and this is usually a situation that leads to the misuse of metadata fields with combining two languages in the same field. Um, sometimes journals do this because they feel like they don't have the capacity to keep the um, elements that would be covered by the form setting. So that's all of that um, uh, text that you would enter uh, about your journal, author guidelines, et cetera. They feel like they can't keep that element of the site up to date. So instead they misuse metadata fields to try to show that they have abstracts available in both languages. And you'll see an example, um, a sort of anti-example as it were on the next page. Um, so here we have a article um, uh, in a journal uh, that uh, provides uh, their abstracts in both English and French, but they have smushed the English and French abstract into the English abstract field. Um, uh, and you see here, it's the only uh, uh, piece of metadata they've done that for. But if you go and look at their homepage, you're also not seeing that language toggle block. There are no other UIs um, installed for this journal. So um, they are um, combining their metadata in a single field, which is going to have problems for some of those indexing services uh, like Google Scholar that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and then, um, as we saw in all of those examples, or the first two examples at least, um, the um, uh, we recommend that uh, galleys are tagged uh, with their um, language. So, in particular, we're most concerned with PDF galleys, but there are other types of galleys that you can um, add into OJS. Um, and uh, that this language tag should correspond to the main language of the body of the article. Um, and this is especially important when you've enabled the UI for multiple languages, because it sends a signal to the user that they might be reading metadata in their own language, but that the article text itself is in a different language. Um, this is another reason why we require submissions to be checked for all the languages in which a journal publishes. It enables a drop-down menu to identify a galley's language, which I think we show a screen cap of on the next slide. Yes, there we go. So there you have where you would edit a layout galley, and there is a drop-down menu showing the, the language tags for that galley. Um, while we're kind of preoccupied at Coalition Publica with translated metadata, because we have a lot of journals that do this, um, let's take a moment to look at the specific case of translations, of full translations, by which I mean an article that was originally written in one language and was translated into another. Um, and perhaps your journal is publishing both versions. So for this use case, we recommend that translations are published as separate articles or submissions on OJS. Why? Because this is, this is due mainly to how um, OJS, as well as the EDU platform, handles DOIs right now. Um, quick aside, in case you're not familiar with um, DOIs, uh, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, which is basically a unique ID that looks kind of like this um, URL that you see here on the bottom of the page that uh, will uh, identify an article and link to wherever it happens, um, where its version of record happens to live on the internet. Um, so in terms of DOIs, as it relates to translations, it is possible with um, DOI registration agencies like Crossref to link the DOI of an original document and the DOI of its translation. But our platforms don't currently um, allow for this at the moment. So since that's not possible, we feel that the next best option is for each version, the original and the translation, to have its own DOI 
with its own metadata to tell them apart, which you can only do in OJS by creating separate articles or submissions. All right, so all of that said, I can move on to our general recommendations for managing multilingual metadata. Um, and keeping in mind that OJS provides separate met uh, metadata fields for each language that you have enabled, um, our very first recommendation is keep multilingual metadata separate. Never put French and English metadata in the same field. Um, the sort of corollary of that is put metadata in the specific in the field that's specific for its language. So never put English metadata in a French language field or French metadata in an English field. Um, uh, we um, also encourage everyone to make sure that your meta uh, multilingual metadata is complete, by which we mean make sure that all the metadata that is included in your galleys, your PDFs, for example, um, are present in OJS and vice versa. So any metadata you put in OJS should also be available in your galleys. So here are some, again, anti-examples. So don't publish a PDF galley that has an abstract in English and French and forget, uh, and forget to put the French abstract in OJS. Uh, also, don't put keywords in English and French in OJS if there are no French keywords in your PDF galley. Um, our next med med uh, recommendation is don't misuse metadata fields, by which we mean never use an OJS field for anything other than the metadata element it is intended to capture. It is much better to leave a metadata field empty than to put a different piece of information in that field just because it ends up displaying the way you think you want it to look um, on your website. So for example, uh, and this is a real world example that we have seen, never put a translated art article title in, for example, the article subtitle field, just so that they display side by side on your OJS. And uh, I can wrap up with a few general thoughts on metadata. Um, metadata uh, quality is really important. Um, there are some basic practices that will get you like 90% there, which as those uh, high achievers who might be among us is not still an A. Um, so if you wanna get an A in your metadata, you could follow these things all the time um, and get it and it's basically always make sure that all metadata in OJS and in your galleys is exactly the same. There shouldn't be little discrepancies between your titles or your author names. They should really be word for word exactly the same. Um, and all journals should um, review uh, their metadata prior to publication. Um, in the context of digital publishing, managing metadata is one of the key functions of a publisher. And uh, you'd be su surprised once you start paying attention how much can change between an article's uh, initial submission and, um, and its final publication. So making that check right before publication to make sure that all that metadata is um, uh, word for word the same um, will um, give you that high quality metadata that's gonna make your journal um, uh, findable. So I'll leave you with uh, an analogy that maybe um, uh, will uh, stick in your mind and, and uh, reinforce why metadata quality is so important. I think of metadata um, as the icing on a cake. Um, if you were walking by a bakery and saw a cake in the window, the icing is what maybe makes you stop, think, oh, that cake looks tasty. I wonder if it's chocolate or if it's vanilla or maybe something else. Um, I might go in and talk, uh, go into the shop and see that cake and the other cakes that are there and then decide to take one of those cakes home and try it for myself. So um, metadata is the icing on the cake that's going to draw your readers in and hopefully um, get them to realize that an article published in your journal is relevant to them and to their research. So on that note, I will pack, pass back to Emma to wrap us up. 
Thank you so much for that, Jessica. It was lovely. So I'm just going to sort of conclude it with a few final thoughts. Uh, the most important being that we are all in this together. So throughout this webinar, we hope that we were able to explain some of the considerations, features, options, potential issues and pitfalls that you might encounter while you're publishing a multilingual. Um, and but we know, we do know that multilingualism in both our software at the software made by PKP and also just uh, multilingualism as it is handled by the scholarly publishing community as a whole is not perfect right now. It's an ongoing conversation. We're still trying to figure out how to do this um, in the most reasonable and thoughtful way that we can. And we really here at PKP and uh, the scholarly community at, at large um, rely heavily on our community members and our language users to tell us what's working, what's not working and what's missing. Um, so PKP specifically, like we've had many people in our around us working on to support multilingualism in different ways. So this is stuff like development, translation, providing feedback, um, doing research, participating in metadata working groups, and plenty more. And we really are intending to increase our efforts to support multilingualism and work more closely with these regional communities in the near future um, through a variety of working groups and other community engagement initiatives this year and moving forward. So we really, really encourage you, strongly encourage you to contribute or reach out to PKP and the community if you have any suggestions about how our software could better serve your um, language community's needs. So just linked at the bottom here is our website where we list all kinds of manners of contribution, the groups you can join, the forums you can participate, the other ways you can share feedback about bugs or issues. So please don't hesitate. We, we love hearing from our community and uh, it's what makes us better. And another key part of this is that if you can contribute or improve to our software uh, translation, we'd love to have you because they're volunteer led. Um, so we always welcome improvements or contributions from the community. There's no special permissions needed. You can follow the instructions that are linked here um, and get started with translating in any language at any time. And I also strongly encourage you to reach out to me personally via email if you need any assistance sort of trying to understand how software or documentation translation works, or you just need help scoping out the project for your language, or you just need to understand how the files are structured within WebLate, because even though I gave an explanation, I know it's not always the easiest thing to follow. Um, lastly, I just wanted to point out that we have some resources and documentation available for you on these subjects. Um, of course, we will share these slides later, but um, we have the PKP documentation hub, which houses all of our documentation, um, and the two sort of key most relevant guides to what we talked about today are using PKP software in multiple languages, which is again, a relatively recently created guide that has been in the works for a very long time that serves as sort of the foundation and inspiration, if you will, for us having this webinar today. And also Better Privacy and Journal Metadata, which is a very in-depth guide that was created in partnership with Coalition Public and EDD um, that will not help you only with your multilingual metadata, but just understanding why metadata is important and how to make it lovely when it flows downstream. So I want to thank you again for coming today and for listening to our webinar. And we really hope that we were able to better explain some of the options available to you for using the software and for publishing in multiple languages. And then hopefully we've given you a couple of hints about how you can construct useful author and editorial policies or guidelines for managing your multilingual metadata. And with that, we have some time for questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much, Emma and Jessica. That was really great. Um, question about the recording. Shall I end it before we take questions or are folks comfortable including the question and answer period in the recording? I think we could record it and then um, at least we have it available if we felt like it's helpful to share with the um, whole presentation. And yes, please go ahead and send any questions that you might come up with later to my email. Again, it's Emma, E-M-M-A at publicknowledgeproject.org. Anytime I, uh, my title is, what is it? Uh, publication support specialist, but I also work as a translation coordinator. So I'm happy to to field any questions at a later date.
Well, Emma, I think we must have done an exceptional job <laughs> because it does not appear that there are any questions. Um, uh, I think that uh, we can both remain uh, uh, available by email if you have any questions. Um, uh, I think my email address may have been on the first slide, but um, uh, Emma and I work very closely together, so she will share with me anything that she feels um, is relevant to our shared work on Coalition Publica. Um, but if anyone would like to contact me um, directly on this or any other subject, um, I've just put my email in the chat. So, yeah, we'll be sending out likely a follow up email to all the attendees. So, again, thank you for coming today um, with the recording information. Um, sort of our contact details if needed. And uh, yeah, we did like to thank you again for coming. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.